aspects of letting go of house and home. It's going to be a lot of fun, so buckle up. Online community, uh, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, just drop them in the comment section and we'll do our best to get to those. And for those of you that are in the room, we'll have a Q&A time when we start wrapping up. Uh, Great Transitions uh, was founded back in 2013, and it's a system for working with seniors and their families as their lifestyles and housing needs change. You know, a move could be two, three years down the road for some of you, or an incident or event could happen that changes things and necessitates making a move really quickly, which can be overwhelming. Whatever the process, wherever you're at, we're here to help guide you through that process. We genuinely believe that helping and guiding seniors is an honor and a privilege, and we are happy to serve this community. That's why we are in partnership with the educational partners that you uh, see in the back of the room. They are like-minded, and they too want to serve this community at a high level. So why are we here? We're here each month to provide education but also an opportunity for connection. Uh, we've built a great little family in this room and uh, I have enjoyed watching the connections get made and the friendships get made over time. But our main objective to start with is education. So we're gonna look throughout our seminar series, uh, legal, financial, housing, medical, other issues of importance to um, seniors and their families. We're not here to sell anything. This is purely educational, but we do have a challenge. And, and I, we always have this challenge every month that we issue, but I want to tweak it just a little bit. Do you have a plan? That's my challenge to you, is I want to see you get your plan made. That plan may sit on your shelf for five years or longer, but you need to have it because is having no plan a plan? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not a good one, is it, Dana? Yeah, right, exactly. So that's what I want you to think about as we begin to talk about our topic. So today, uh, last month we had a little chat with Dr. Nikki Buckaloo. So we're going to take, kind of build on the foundation that she set for us. And we're going to go uh, a few steps further into the process of downsizing and talk about that. So I'm switching gears and we're going to have a nice chat in the living room. Is that okay with you guys? Awesome. Awesome. So I want to take a little survey uh, as we get going. How many of you have been in your home 10 years or more? Okay. Keep your hand up if you've been in your home 15 years or more, 20 years or more, 25 years or more, 30 years or more, 35 years or more, 40 years or more, 45 years or more, 42. 42. You win the prize, Bobby. Does she get a new free house? <laughs> <laughs> if I could, I would. It would be a monopoly house. Yeah. Uh, right? Lots of renovations in 42 years. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. And have you fixed things when they broke? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right? Um, have you all heard the expression forever home? Yeah. I, I think we hear that on HGTV, the young couple stuff, and this is going to be our forever <laughs> oh, home. Right. And we talked last month about independent living. Like, is independent living really independent? Yeah. yeah. No, it's not. We depend on a lot of people. Is a forever home really forever? No. No, it isn't. And so we know that we are all going to downsize at some point. 
that, and I'll probably echo this throughout our talk today, it could be a smaller single family home, a condo, a villa, uh, a retirement community, a pine box, or an urn. But we are all going to downsize at some point. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so that's what we're going to dive into today, is really talk about uh, that whole concept of making a move and the feelings and emotions that we have around it. And then part of your homework is going to be the practical side of how we get through some of that. So when we talk about making the making a move, um, what are some of the things that come to your mind when you think about, I have to make a move? Overwhelming stuff. Overwhelming stuff. Is that packing how boxes? Am gonna, how am I going to organize all this? How am I going to get it organized? Decluttering. Decluttering. Does everybody know where they're going next? Yeah. No. Oh my gosh, trying to figure that out, right? There are a few options in the greater Orlando area. And then uh, I think, Beverly, we talked. Do you move close to your family who might be on the other side of the state or in another state? Or do you move close to your friends in your life that you have now, right? Lots of decisions that have to be made. But I think the first two answers are probably the most telling, and that was overwhelm and stuff, right? <laughs> it all stems from that. So that's what we're gonna dive into today. So let's talk about what do our material possessions mean to us? What do they represent in our lives? Why are some things so hard to give up? And why do some people have more trouble than others? Or I kind of look at that question a little differently and say, why is it so easy for some people to give up stuff? And I have such a struggle with it, right? Right? So in all the research, as I was preparing for our talk today, in all the research, um, there's a lot of information about how to organize, how to pack, how to systematically and the systems and the processes to go through all of the things. What there's not a lot of in the research is the why. The why. The why. And that's because we're all different, right? And we all come with our own set of luggage into life. And we pack that luggage and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, right? And that's the emotions and the feelings and the attachments and the accumulations. Um, so it all comes down to that, the way we accumulate and attach to our stuff. And everybody deals with it differently. Some people take the concept of Swedish death cleaning and they practice that religiously and they're faithful to it and they're really good at it. Other people take this approach. Yeah. <laughs> Someday, son, all of this will be yours. I don't know if he could have gotten anything else in. In fact, it's filling out, right? Uh, son standing there with his hands on his hips. We were meeting with a couple a few weeks ago, and they were talking about dealing with all of this stuff. Uh, that their kids had left at their house when they moved away, right? 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. And, and the, the gentleman said, we're thinking about just getting a couple of pies and just loading it all in and sending it to their driveway <laughs> and letting them go through it, right? But we all deal with the stuff differently. Now, science tells us right now that there are seven living generations. I was reading a statistic, actually when I was preparing for last month's talk, that our lifespan has doubled in 150 years. Never before have we seen seven living generations, right? Or rarely, I should say. There's always outliers. Uh, the person that is from the greatest generation or the silent generation are they going to deal with their stuff differently than Gen Z or Gen Alpha? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I was looking at this story, I was reminded my father-in-law, he passed away a year ago next week. 
and he was a general contractor down in South Florida. He built the house that they lived in for 50 years, and in that house was a mighty fine workshop. He had every kind of tool, he had parts and gadgets because he fixed everything. When something broke, Pop, you knew Pop was going to fix it. My son just bought his first house a couple weeks ago. He does not have a workshop. Now, he probably wants a workbench, but he's not fixing things, right? What are, what are the younger generations doing? Hire someone. Hire someone or replace it, right? And in all fairness, the technology has changed, right? You could work on a car. And a TV. Yeah. Oh, all of that. You could work on a car that was built in the 60s because you open up the engine and it was pretty straightforward, right? Battery, oil, distributor cap, shock absorbers, all that stuff. Have you looked in the engine of your new car lately? No. You need a computer engineering degree, right? So we don't have the wherewithal to fix those things, right? So it's different. We all deal with our uh, stuff differently. And that's because there's this pattern of accumulation. So we start out with, um, I have nothing. When my mother and my grandmother took me to college to move me into the dorm, everything I owned fit in the back of my grandmother's not full-size station wagon. It was a smaller station wagon, right? I couldn't even take my bedroom furniture because my mother said that belonged to her. Right? <laughs> so I have nothing. And then we moved to, I have the necessities, right? Maybe a first apartment to, I have nice things. We begin to accumulate some of the stuff. And then we get to that point of I could have everything I could want. And then it begins to shift a little bit. I don't need everything I have. Uh, some of you may remember when Jane Cole uh, talked with us one time, we talked about she was helping a lady organize her kitchen and she had nine spatulas. <laughs> yeah, decided she didn't need all of them. Um, I need to get rid of some of these things. I can no longer care for my things because maybe it's a really big house and it's just getting harder and harder to the reality of I must let go of the things I no longer need and others will deal with my things, right? When we're gone, like the gentleman in the cartoon earlier, he was just leaving everything for his son. So what does our accumulation mean? What does it represent? Well, as we start in the early part of this, it's who we want to be. I remember buying our first uh, real furniture, right? And, and we'd had hand-me-down furniture for many years, and then we actually went to a furniture store. <laughs> it was on clearance, but we still bought new furniture, right? To, so it's who we want to be, and then it becomes who we are at some point in our lives, and then it becomes who we were, right? So it's a reflection of the life that we have lived. Um, and it tells us a lot about people when we start looking at their things. So it tells us their personalities, their hobbies, their projected self-image, their values, uh, their circumstances. As a realtor, I've been in thousands of houses over the years. Uh, we were in, we helped a couple move to a community earlier this year and I walked in, and within the first five minutes, I said, who's the photographer? Because I saw these beautiful enlarged photos all around the house, and I knew that it had to be them, one of them, or a family member. And, and the husband said, oh, it's me. Beautiful nature photography. That was very important. That's who he was. He's still taking pictures um, and is still active in photography. Um, it's, I've seen beautiful artwork. I've seen random collections, um, antique furniture, ornate brought, you know, from many places. And uh, I've even been in a couple of homes uh, where a hospital bed was in the living room. I met with a gentleman several years ago and his wife, and uh, they were needing to make a plan because he was in a hospital bed in his living room, and he was super concerned with the items that were in the guest room. 
They didn't have any bedroom furniture in the guest room, but he had a train table in the guest room with mountains and trees and multiple layers of track and switches. And it was the smaller, is that HO gauge, the smaller trains? Yeah. And, and that was his legacy, right? That was what he was leaving behind, but he was in this circumstance that made it very challenging. So it just causes us to think about um, what makes it so hard to let go of all of this stuff, right? So there are a lot of reasons. Uh, these are a few, really the big ones, kind of broad categories. Emotion and sentimentality. You may have something uh, that belonged to a family member. Um, Judy, I'm going to reference you again. We talked about a pot that was a wedding gift to your parents, right? That has some sentimental value to you. And so it's something that she's really working hard on considering. Um, utility and practicality. We do see this more in men than we do in women. Um, needing to take tools when you may be downsizing to a retirement community where you don't even have to hang the pictures on your wall again, right? <laughs> but you need to have a hammer and a screwdriver and a wrench and all those things, right? Uh, financial component or investments. Uh, a lot of people have been in homes with beautiful artwork. Uh, we've had a couple of clients that have had highwayman paintings. Some of you are familiar. They may have paid 25 or $30 for that painting back in the 70s, and now it's worth 2,500 or 3,000, right? So they're absolutely gonna be taking something like that with them. I've also seen people that have spent lots of money on an item to see it become devalued over time, where there's no real market for it. Um, so that can be, that can hit hard if you spend a lot of money on something at some point. Um, Waterford Crystal. Back in the 80s and the 70s, that was the, the thing, right? Well, now it's hard to sell because there's not as much of a market for it. Um, identity and image. Uh, the collections that you have, how your house is decorated. We were in a home recently that uh, the, the seller had, or the owner had built it, designed it, and it echoed Frank Lloyd Wright. Right? That was something that was very important to her. She was an aficionado of architecture. And uh, that was um, of value to her. And then, of course, estate or legacy, right? Which one of these do you think is the most powerful? Well, maybe she's part of one. Emotion. Emotion is a big one. But I would argue that legacy is even more important, right? The legacy component. It's interesting, and it's gonna vary from person to person, right? Um, we were, Leanne and I were talking earlier, and I said, can I talk about one of your legacy pieces? We moved uh, Leanne and Bob earlier this year, and she has a jar, big jar. I say jar, you think this, no, it's uh, big that your dad brought from China in the 20s, 1920s, and it's filled with newspapers, right? And that, that jar tells a big story, and that's a big part of legacy, right? And so, was that going in the estate sale? No. Yeah, that's gonna go with you and stay with you, of course. And those stories get passed down to family, right? So, really cool. Um, so let's talk about that legacy component a little bit. I want to reference a book called How to Say It to Seniors. I had to read this book to get my certification as a senior housing professional. It was part of the curriculum for that program. But I had actually read it before then when I was talking to my own parents about downsizing. This gentleman, David Soley, wrote it really for adult children or people that are caring for older adults to kind of understand their mindset a little bit. I think it would be helpful for an older adult to understand maybe what your kid is thinking if you have a kid or maybe a niece or nephew that's helping you out with things. But he talks about two phase of life tasks that are critical. One is maintaining, a, maintaining control in a world 
where all control is being lost. Um, and where's one of the easiest places to exercise control? Our stuff. Because I might need it. Now Martha gave it to me. I like it. I use it maybe once every three years, right? <laughs> Things of that. And you've heard that expression, I'll give up my Hummel collection when they cry it out of my cold hand, right? Because we're losing control in other areas of our life. Maybe uh, we're having to go to the doctor more and they're giving us more information and telling us we have to go get this test and that test and do this or that. Or maybe we're getting help around the house with the landscaping or the cleaning or meal prep or different things like that. But we can control our stuff. Right? That just, it's something that we can manage. But we have to get through the stuff to begin to work on that legacy component. So the second concern is leaving a legacy in a world where time is running short. And it's running short for all of us. Are we living longer? Yes, we are. We're living much longer. And yet, how are we going to leave this world when we depart it? If we can learn to solve control in an effective way, we can move on to that legacy component. That's the fun part, the legacy component. It's the stuff we enjoy and what we're sharing with our family or organizations we support or our friend group or our church or whatever it is that's important to you. Um, maintaining control on the stuff or being hyper-focused on the stuff prohibits us from building legacy. So then we want to think of downsizing as a vehicle to building legacy. I didn't really think about that much until I started preparing for this talk because we kind of, I've always talked about those two things separately. But downsizing is the practical step to helping us build our legacy. And so we want to take a look at what downsizing looks like. So with each downsize, I'm, I downsized, uh, this is 2024, three years ago. I had a four bedroom, three bath house with a pool um, that was 20-ish years old. And I live alone, it was a lot to take care of. My son had gone uh, out, graduated from college, he was working. so. I needed something that was a little easier for me to care for and gave me a little freedom. So I ended up purchasing a smaller home, three bedrooms, two bath, with an office, no pool, and it was new construction. So the systems were strong, the roof is good, don't have to worry about much of anything. I do still have, I don't live independently, I have help with the yard and other things around the house when an appliance breaks or whatever. Um, so it, Maybe for you, though, it may not be downsizing necessarily to a uh, smaller home. It may be downsizing within a home. Uh, we've seen that happen before, and that's saying goodbye to a part of the life we created. I talked to a lady a couple of years ago who hadn't been upstairs in her house in like six months. She was living in the living room, dining room, kitchen, not really the dining room, uh, living room, kitchen, bedroom, and bathroom. She had no need to go upstairs, her knees hurt, so why go upstairs, there was nothing to do up there. She had downsized. She still had all the stuff, but she had downsized, right? Um, when we downsize, we're reducing the number of decisions, which must be made, and we're limiting the amount of effort required on non-essential tasks due to our physical or cognitive abilities. Things change, right, over time. Um, we're simplifying our lives, and simplification is good. It's free. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. But the hard part is we're facing our own mortality, right? So that can be a little challenging. And when we're looking at all of these decisions over the stuff, right, and the overwhelm, we can develop what's called decision fatigue. Decision fatigue, you know what it is. We've all experienced it, right? I've got to do this, 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 this. I don't know how I'm going to get my head around any of it. We talked about overwhelm. That is overwhelm. And then 
if you couple that with maybe being ill or under the weather, um, being in a transition or crisis, struggling with uh, where you're going to go, what you're going to do, or even grieving, that makes that decision fatigue even that much harder. Um, we talk about this in our Downsizers Club, and if you're trying to make all the decisions at one time, it you just, you know that emoji with the head exploding? <laughs> That's kind of the way it feels like, right? Where are you going to move? Are you going to get a one bedroom with a den, or maybe a two bedroom? Are you gonna to go to a single family home or a condo or a retirement community? And is that gonna be a continuing care retirement community or is it gonna be a rental community? Like all the things. When's the family coming into town or my, uh, to take a look at all the items I've set aside in the guest room for them to, to look at? What's the timeline look like? And then we come in, Nicole and I sit down with you to start planning and we're saying, you know, start looking through your closet and decide the shoes that you wanna take. <laughs> right? It's all too much. We can only do so much without pooping out. Highly scientific term, right? Um, but the goal is to still be able to do the things we want to do, but do it in a smaller space, right? So that we can um, have a richer life and not suffer from all of the weight of all of the stuff and the decision fatigue and all the emotions. We had some clients that moved a couple years ago. She was struggling with some health issues and cognitive issues, and he was doing the best that he could to maintain house and home. But I got to tell you, when they we got them moved, there was dust in that house like crazy. It was just not great. And when they got moved into their new place, um, they were so much better because they had a smaller space to care for. They had weekly housekeeping. They weren't prepping meals because they were going downstairs to the dining room. Uh, their life was just so much easier. And they felt good about their home rather than feeling overwhelmed about their home. And it was wonderful to um, see them become free, right? They had more energy, more bandwidth. Uh, he was taking some classes and she was getting uh, some company from some other people besides just her husband, which was great, right? So um, as we, we look at that, we know that it's a process and it can be overwhelming. Uh, Nikki, when she and I were talking after our seminar last week, she shared this next slide with me, this graph that she developed. Now, she's a PhD, um, and so I want to preface this to say this comes from her experience. There was no scientific research that went into it, um, but this is her experience because she's been doing this a lot longer than I have. And we look at, kind of echoing what we talked about earlier, as we go through this graph of starting at birth, where we have very little, Right, and we begin to accumulate stuff into this bell curve at the top, which uh, we go to college, some of us get married, we reach that middle age where maybe we've got a career, we've got all the nice things, we're doing all the fun stuff, and then we begin to uh, go to the other side of that bell curve. So, uh, empty nesters, but maybe they still have a lot of furniture in the house. Uh, we were in a house last year and the child's bedroom looked the same as it did when the child left, pretty much. The child's 58 years old. Come get your stuff! But mom and dads were left to deal with that, right? So we're, we're looking at this right side of the graph and we're seeing as we downsize once, maybe downsize twice, I've downsized once, I probably have two more downsizes in my future. Um, at least that's what I think right now. Um, and if we don't deal with the stuff and the overwhelm, what happens is this level of grief and hassle, the weight of the stuff gets magnified. Right? And it's heavy. It's heavy. And so we're stuck in that emotional weight 
not able to make decisions and move forward into the legacy component, which is the free and the fun component. Because we all want to leave this world better than the way we found it. And um, being able to build legacy is great. Now, there are lots of ways that we can downsize, certainly. I want you to think for a second about someone who maybe has endured a natural disaster. A lot of us have endured some hurricane damage over the years. Has anyone completely lost their home to fire, flood, tornado, anything like that? My sister and brother-in-law did. Okay. The 2004, 2005 hurricane. Because they, they were living on the river in Vero Beach. Everything flooded. And they just lost, the whole house had to be gutted. Raised, completely rebuilt. Okay. They didn't have any stuff to deal with, did they? His mother lived two doors down. That was the end of that. She moved into Indian River Estates. Okay. Because she just the grief was overwhelming, couldn't go through with the fact of going back and rebuilding, right? That is an overwhelming grief. I can only imagine what that is like. But it does eliminate the need to make decisions, right? We don't want to downsize that way. We have uh, some clients that we're working with now. They lost most of their home in a fire several years ago, uh, rebuilt, and have a beautiful home now. So they have the grief of the fire, but now due to some medical issues, they're thinking of moving and downsizing, and they're going through grief again, right, in the same house, because they chose to keep that house that they had it can be overwhelming. Um, and it's not just natural disasters. Homes get burglarized and they take everything or they take only the good stuff, right? And you're left with, you know, I was saving that for a family member or it meant a lot to me or whatever. That happened, gosh, I just now thought of this. Uh, right after we got married, uh, we got, the week we got back from our honeymoon, our apartment was vandalized or burglarized. And they took, uh, necklace of mine that was a basketball. Listen, I was more mathlete than athlete in school. It wasn't for me, but it was my grandfather's. He played on the Florida All-State basketball team back in the 20s, and that was their prize, right? And so that was something very special to me that somebody took, and I'll never see again. Right? So there's grief around that. Um, there are a lot of items that we struggle with. Right? And this is just a small list. Pianos, books, Bibles, photos, vacation albums, clothing, shoes, tools, large appliances. We'll talk about that in a second. China, silver, antique furniture, gifts, handmade items, christening gowns, coffee mugs. What else? What else? Christmas decorations. Christmas decorations. Anything else? I know some of you aren't ready to speak about it, but you're thinking of something, right? Why do you think large appliances is on there? Yeah, standalone freezer in your or maybe a garage or refrigerator. Why do people want to take that with them? They want to maintain the lifestyle they've always had, right? My son just bought a new house. He's grown up with having a refrigerator in the garage. He did buy a TV, that was his first purchase, the big TV, right? A typical 27-year-old male. But he's like, Mom, i got to get a garage refrigerator. Because that's where the beer and the soda goes. Right? That's the lifestyle. And you think you're going to take that with you when you're downsizing into a smaller space. Why are coffee mugs so important? They're so important. They're from all the art festivals. That is a scrapbook in your kitchen, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of memories. Uh, I have a, a coffee mug in my cabinet that I never used, but it belonged to my husband, right? Before he died, that was his mug. So I'm going to keep it, right? Because that's a little bit of him. Um, and then, so we look at all these things. I, I want to mention pianos really quickly. I had some clients, uh, they moved to one of our communities a few years ago, and he was a professional musician. And when I say professional musician, I mean New York Philharmonic. Really good. 
And he had a, they had a 1926 Steinway Baby Grand. Beautiful instrument. Now I took piano lessons for 17 years. I am not that good, but I had some major appreciation for that Steinway Baby Grand. Do you know we could not find a home? We struggled to find a home for that piano. So if we struggled to find a home for that piano, the spinet in my front room has no hope, <laughs> right? Right? It is, it is probably not going to go. So all of these things are um, things that we struggle with. We had, uh, well, and then think about it. If you have to make decisions fast, uh, maybe an event or circumstance happens and you've got to make a move, what some people do is say, well, I'm just going to keep it and I'll go through it later. Oh, yeah. Box it up and go through it later. Yeah. Yeah. Have time. Right. Or make time. I did that once. We moved from to North Carolina and back to Florida. There were some boxes that I had not unpacked for five years. And that was a heavy weight on me. And when I finally got through them, strapped up my boots and got through those boxes, it was a very free feeling to not have all the stuff. We had a client last year that she had been on the wait list at the community and the unit she wanted came available. And so we had to make a move with her really quickly. And she took way too much stuff. And she was in her new apartment and she's like, this is, I brought too much. I brought way too much. And when she was supposed to be enjoying life, getting connected with new friends and, and having an easy, easy way, it was just weighed heavily on her. Um, and that was, that was a hard thing to see, right? So if you do have to make that move quickly, and if you have time, great, but most people don't, right? They have stuff. I've seen people put stuff in a storage unit, and they're paying a couple hundred dollars a month for how long. Uh, Dana, Sean, is that a wise investment? <laughs> if you own the storage unit, right? If you had invested in the storage unit. And it goes up each year. And it does go up each year. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, we've talked about a lot of heavy things today. And I want to talk about your assignment a little bit. So I'd like you to all flip over to your homework page. Now we're going to talk through this a little bit and get some practical help in dealing with some of that stuff. So at the very top, I'd like you to put the date on your paper um, because this may be something that you're able to take and begin to use immediately or it may be something that you want to look at and reflect on maybe in a month or two. Right? But I am going to hold you accountable next month when I see you to find out if you've done your homework. So you've got a little over 30 days, plenty of time. Do not wait till the last minute and cram the next floor. Okay? So let's go item number one. <clears throat> Items that I am now struggling with or anticipate struggling to let go. If you're a couple, you can't share this. You, each person has to do their own, right? Everybody has their own, because what's important to her may not be important to him. Uh, if you're here without your spouse, make a copy, or we'll send you a copy so your spouse can have one of their own. So you have to work on this in your own. I have put three lines here. You may need to go to the back of the page if you want it, right? Um, Judy, I'm thinking about the wedding gift that we talked about earlier. This is something that you're like thinking about. You might be able to take it with you. No, you might not want to. So that item might go on this list, right? Just as an example. And then the second thing I want you to do is go back and rate these items. So you're going to give them a 1 to 10 rating. So 1 being, it's a minor struggle. I like it, I don't love it, but my Martha gave it to me and I really don't know that I should just give it up. To major struggle, uh, this is a christening gown that's been in my family for 150 years and every child that's been christened in the family has worn it, whatever, okay? So one to 10, 
Five is kind of that middle of the road. I'm not really sure how hard this is going to be. So you get the idea, right? One, pretend you're going to rate every item. Um, and then this next one's going to require a little bit of thought. And I want you to be really honest with yourself, not to be judgy, but to just be observant. Things I anticipate I will miss most about my current home or residence if I were to move. Related to the home, or is that related to society? Society. About your residence, because you could still visit those other places if that's your favorite Publix. No, with friends and yeah, like that. no. Okay. Let's talk about the house, all right? Your residence. Um, so I'm not planning to downsize anytime soon, right? Like 10 or 15 years. But there are things about my house that I would miss if I had to get it up. Right, it's super easy. When I was on my knee scooter, it was super easy to navigate all the way around it. I enjoy the view out of my back slider onto the conservation area behind my house. Right, so jot down those three things. Um, and um, as you're looking at the items in number one, so these specific items that you may be struggling with, and the home itself, right. Um, know that there are going to be some items that you don't have to decide about. Um, there are things that you are going to take with you, certainly, right? So don't even put those on the list because you know you're taking those with you, okay? Um, if your list is becoming rather extensive, I recommend you start earlier on this project rather than waiting until the last minute, right? Because we want to work through things. Everyone downsizes, whether they like it or not, and so time to create the plan is now. So item number four, write down what these items represented to others, what the meaning they held for you, where did that meaning originate? So let me give you some examples, right? Because that's kind of hard to think about. So let's say you have your grandmother's china, okay? Uh, it makes me think of special gatherings, family gatherings. When I was a child at holidays or special occasions, my grandmother would take the china out of her hutch and we would get to decorate the table with it. It all had to be hand washed and dried. Remember that? Yeah. It makes me think of fond memories with my extended family and the laughs and stories and songs that we shared. I think of the fantastic food that was always prepared. Uh, my aunt's biscuits, uh, conch peas from my uncle's garden, fresh collard greens, and of course my grandmother's chocolate cake, right? That's how you wanna think about these things. That's being really honest with yourself. Is there any judgment in any of that? No, no absolutely not. But writing these things down helps, right? And so, when you think about these items and letting them go, and as you're talking about this, what feelings tend to come to the surface? And men, you have feelings too, <laughs> okay? You need to get in touch with them because unless you get really clear about your feelings, this is the emotional part that we're gonna talk about, unless you get really clear about those feelings, you tend to squash those feelings, right? And when you squash the feelings, do you make decisions? Nope, you don't. And our goal here is to make decisions, right? Um, so if it makes you angry that you have to get rid of something, write it down. If it depresses you that you have to get rid of something, write it down. If it makes you sad that you have to let something go, write it down. Those feelings are going to release you from the connection with the item, right? And then it makes the process a little bit easier. You may feel guilty. You may feel um, heartbroken. You may feel nostalgic, right? These are all feelings and we feel them, but they're just that, feelings. So our fifth item is gonna apply not only to uh, the items that we've listed in number one, but also the things that we might miss about our home or current residence. If you were to have a conversation with the item or, not of, but or the giver or maker of the item, what would you say to it 
or them as you let it go. So it might sound something like this. You can write this down or you might just speak it out loud. You might find yourself walking around your house talking to different items. I don't think they're gonna talk back. They're good <laughs> listeners, right? So um, maybe this is an item. Grandma's China, right? Hello, China dishes. I really enjoyed my time with you and all of the memories that I have because of it. However, I have some new dishes that are very pretty and I can put them in the dishwasher. This gives me more time with my grandchildren. Grandma, I'm glad you have these dishes and I'm grateful that you taught me how to set a proper table and for all of the delicious meals that you prepare. Thank you for letting me have them when you no longer needed them. I'm glad that I get to bless them onto someone else who will make wonderful memories of their own. Feels pretty good, right? Hard? Yes. But it helps those feelings. Now let's say you're going to be leaving your home. So you might have a conversation with uh, a part of your home or a room or the favorite places in your home. So I told you how much I like the view out of my back porch or my slider and onto my back porch. So I might say, hello, back porch. Thank you for all the mornings I sat here with my coffee and had my quiet time. You gave me a glimpse of nature each morning as I could see the birds gather around the feeder as the sun came up. Many good times were had out here watching football and sharing dinner with family on cool evenings, which let's be honest, that was about three months out of the year. But I'm grateful for you. I won't miss cleaning you. It's a chore. But I will miss the views and the memories. Right? So I'm moving on to the next step. Right? Um, emotions are hard. and can be a little sticky. And we have a community here where we can talk about that. Whether it's in our Downsizers Club, whether you just want to have a coffee date with me, um, whether you want to connect with one of the educational partners, that's why we're here, uh, to support one another and talk through these things. I'm super excited about our next month's topic, um, which I'll address in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to see if any of you have any questions. Um, and I, or one of our educational partners, will do our best to try and answer them. So does anybody have, I know this was a little bit of a heavy topic, Linda, you've got a question. Robin's coming to you with the microphone. So we'll uh, see what your question is. This is all so emotional, but my big stumbling place is what do I do with this stuff? Mm. So, you know, you can't put it at the curb. You can take it to Goodwill. There, you know, your grandma's china is better than Goodwill. Nobody at Goodwill wants that china. Right. So my big stumbling block is where can I get this stuff here? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's, anybody else struggling with what, where, where am I going to take all this stuff, right? So there are a lot of options. Um, for some people, the option may be an estate sale, right? And that may be how we're going to empty out the house, get all of the things that you don't want removed from the house. That's an opportunity for you to make a little bit of money as well that could offset some of the costs of moving. Um, so that's an option. Uh, but some of you are ready to work through the stuff now, and maybe you're not going to be making a move anytime soon. Um, and so you're just, uh, I'm, Judy, I'm talking about you all day because we had such a great conversation. <laughs> Judy has a box that she puts stuff in, and when the box gets filled up, she takes it to her charity of choice. There are different charities that will take different things. We have a lot of resources for finding out where those are. Um, you may live in a condo, and estate sales aren't allowed in a condo, right? We have options for that, too. There could be an online estate sale or an auction house that would take some of the things. Uh, and we, um, so I think it's very, you know how we always say it depends? Let's talk about your specific situation, and we can make some recommendations based on that because Goodwill may not want the China, but every estate sale does the China sell. Yes. The China sells it in the estate sale. So somebody wants it, right? Somebody wants it. Yeah. 
Tanami? Oh, Tanami? Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that um, I had, when I knew what this was going to be, yeah. um, I, it sort of pushed me to start. And so I started, but I couldn't start on the things that yes. were, made me sad. So I started on my closets. Because my, my clothing does not make me sad. Yeah. <laughs> it does not make me sad. And so I filled up lots of bags. I, I take it to a charity um, that does, is not Goodwill. And um, they give it to people who need, the, need it. And, um, awesome. Which makes me feel good. And so that's where I started. The other stuff is where it's going to be sure. much more difficult. But I think I think that is a great point. Start on the easy stuff. Because what does that do? It builds a little. We talk about this a lot in our programming and our thought patterns, right? That builds your mindset that, okay, I did the closet in the spare bedroom. Okay, I can tackle the junk drawer in the kitchen. And then maybe I'll start going through some of those pictures, right? Because maybe that's the hard part for you or whatever. But it builds momentum. Uh, we have to, activity changes our feelings, right? We can change our feelings. And remember we've talked before in here about neuroplasticity of the brain. The brain doesn't know the difference between a truth and a lie. So if you're walking around saying, this is going to be so hard, I'm so overwhelmed, I'll never get through it all, you're breaking those neural connections in your head. Is it going to be hard? Yes. But your brain doesn't know the difference between the truth and the lie. So I can do this. I can tackle a closet. I can tackle a drawer. I can get through this, and it's going to be fun. <laughs> and that strengthens those neural connections. And it makes you make better decisions, right? Awesome. Okay, we got a question up front here? No, a question. Well, hold on. We'll get you a microphone because we all want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Something funny. What has helped me a time or two, mm -hmm. I'll stub my toe on something one too many times, it's out the door. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can identify with that. I probably don't need that. I have very homely voice. Um, you yeah. mentioned Downsizers Club. What is this Downsizers yeah. Club? <laughs> <laughs> so the Downsizers Club is for people that have decided they want to make a move. Okay. That move may be six months down the road. It may be 18 months down the road. But we're going to go through processes that help you uh, come to the decisions that you want to make. So you can't join the Downsizers Club if you're going to be in it for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk, right? Uh, check on your box, on your blue form, that you're interested in the Downsizers Club. We'll get with you. We normally meet the first Wednesday of the month, but sometimes that changes, so I don't want to give you a hard time. Where's the Downsizers Club on, on this? Down towards the bottom. The evaluation? Uh, I might have been. It's replaced with the fall community. Oh, okay. Just, uh, you know what? We put the fall community tour information on there. So just right below the fall community tours, right oh. Downsizers Club. Okay, got it. If that's something you want. If you are going to move out of your house, into something smaller. And you're saying probably within the next 10 years or less? So. Oh, no. <laughs> like, like next month or less? Maybe, maybe a year and a half. Oh, okay. Right? Because we're, gonna, we're probably going to shift some things around as we come into 2025. Because sometimes what happens, we've seen this. Can I talk about you a little bit, Jen? Sure. Okay. Joe came to our downsizers club thinking that she needed to move out of her house. But through the process of the Downsizers Club, things have changed, right? So she may be in her house a little bit longer than she needs to be. So she probably doesn't need to downsize because she's decluttered, right? Much more to do. Right? Right? But it may not be as imminent as you once thought it was, right? 
family situations have changed. So we can talk through those things to decide if it's a good fit for you. Because what we do in this Downsizers Club is we're going to be talking about the things that move you forward. And if you're not moving forward, you're not going to get anything out of the Downsizers Club. See my point? Well, the Downsizers Club is about moving somewhere else. Eventually, because... It's not about getting rid of stuff, it's about moving somewhere Right, because there's a difference between decluttering and downsizing. Right? Right? And sometimes it may start with decluttering to make the space that you have easier to manage. But it may not mean downsizing for you. Right? So those are things we can talk about. I think we're going to, um, we're going to, be making some changes in 2025 so that we can serve the population. If we need to have some a declutter club and a club. or a decluttering, yeah, we may have a decluttering <laughs> workshop, and we're going to get done with some brass tacks about how to do it, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. I really appreciate that. Do we have any other questions? No. Yeah. I don't know where to go with this question. I've become the family historian for many, many years. And I have things that are from four generations back. Wow. And some of the things might be quite valuable to me. How do I figure that out? Yeah. The kids don't want them. Yeah. Yeah. So we have people that we can connect you with um, that we work a lot. Our estate sale vendors uh, do a ton of research. And so they know, some of it they know, yeah, some of it they, they don't know, um, but they'll find out, right? We've sent them picture. We've been in a house before, and somebody says, oh, this is a genuine Picasso. <laughs> and we've sent them pictures, and they're like, mm. <laughs> or, oh, you know, it's not Picasso, but it's his younger brother, or whatever, things like that. So we'll find out those things and see what the best route for some of those things are. Um, because, like the China, Goodwill may not want it, but there are people that do. There are even people that buy old photographs, and they're using them in the bathroom at Bar Italia or wherever to decorate with, right? You've seen, you go in restaurants and you see pictures of people, right? Where do you think those things? Uh, the big one at Mission Barbecue. All kinds of firefighter and... and um, Army and military pictures in there of people. They probably glean those at a thrift store or at an estate sale or something, right? It's somebody's son or brother or daughter or you know mother, but it just didn't have a place to go. So there are resources for all of those things. And I will say it's a heavy weight to be the family historian. Do we have any other family historians in the room? Yeah, that's hard. That's the legacy component that you want to work on. So, you remember the 1926 Steinway that I told you about earlier? Yes. We couldn't find a place for it, but we did find a place for it. And it went to Kinneret uh, in downtown Orlando, um, which is a housing complex, and it is being enjoyed by people. It was a donation. The value on it was significant. Nobody wanted to buy it, but it's being richly used, and that made the donor very happy. Yeah, it got a second life. Exactly. It really did. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? What I did, can you hear me? Yes. What I did a couple of Christmases ago when I was a decluttering, uh, cluttering, I took up the pictures. I have a lot of photo albums, and I've done a lot of pictures. And I had six grandchildren. So I had six photo albums for the grandchildren of their pictures of them, their great grandparents, and their grandparents showing them the history, the names of the grandparents, the mothers, the fathers, and their baby picture, their mom's baby picture, all the way up to where they are now. Each, each of the boys is five boys. That is, they, they, wanted, they wanted them. And they're in Texas, they're all wow. over. But then now they can look at this picture they're showing their girls, and this is what I look like, babe. This is what my great grandmother looks like. Yeah. They love it. And also in my garage, I had uh, CDs and LDs and uh, uh, DVDs of Michael Jackson originals. I have LPs, 13 brand new in the cover. They are fighting over. 
That is awesome, Jeanette. And what a labor of love to compile those. But so did you, was it hard work to get all that together? Yes, it was. And I still have some myself. I gave you six of them and some four of my children. Mm -hmm. And so we, I had these 10, 12 albums, and they were all trying to get this in together. But I have some of the masters, the really big ones, and I have the negatives. And I went to the Walgreens and all that, Costco, and they said, yeah, they still can reproduce the negatives. Yeah. So one more question. Um, how does that make you feel about your about your? But let me ask it specifically. How does that make you feel about the legacy you're leaving for your family? It made me feel really good because, like I say, I've always took the pictures when I was little. We were very poor, and all I had was pictures. We had a little bitty brownie camera yeah. way back when, and I would do it. And my mom said, "Where can you use your allowance for?" And I just look at her and she said, "You always win pictures." She said, they're going to fade. They won't be any good. But I would go and find places, you know, photo people so you put it in this type of shape. You do this kind of color. And I did it. It made me feel good. Because I thought, if anything happens to me, my grandkids won't know what their great-grandmother was. If she was an Indian, if she was full-fledged black foot Indian, they don't even know that. So it's a lot of things they don't know. It makes wow. you look young. That's why. I suppose I did with my great-grandmother. So I put her recipes in there. We put them to eat and stuff. And what did you get sick? This is supposed to put up. What was supposed to drink? Not so we just did it naturally. Love that. Love that. That's great. That's great. Okay, one more. Right up these fall community tours? Yes. I'm going to talk to you. Do we meet you at the yes. place? Yes. Oh, okay, because I didn't know it was like you had a box, everybody meets somewhere. And then you we know, thought about you that, know. and then you, I thought y'all would be getting too rowdy if we had a box. <laughs> so. That would be fun. We could have moved on the box. <laughs> No. <laughs> That'd be enough. All right. Let me wrap up with a couple of announcements. So first and foremost, next month, October 23rd, right here, same bat time, same bat channel, we're going to be uh, talking with people who have already made a move and lived to tell about it. So we're going to get survivor stories. I will be checking your homework, so make sure you do your homework. Uh, you might get a gold star if you do your homework when you come back next month. Uh, be sure to complete your survey and leave it with Susan or Nicole or me. Autumn Art Festival. If you want to come to the art festival, check in with Nicole or I, me, Nicole or me. Um, and we'll make sure that we get you the link to register for that so you can be eligible to win one of the prizes. Some of you, how many have already entered? Did you already enter? I think you entered, didn't you? Well, if you haven't entered yet, it's in our newsletter that you got via email, and uh, we need to put that link on our website, maybe. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll send it to you. Um, and then uh, we encourage you to bring a friend with you next month. A friend that's never been here before so we can help share some of this information with them. Thank you all so much for coming. We will see you next month. Thank you.